before we get started, we need to ask God's blessing. So if you are able to kneel with me, would you kneel as we pray, please? Father, we're so thankful for you, for Jesus, the gift of your Son, and for your Word. And as we open your Word and consider uh, this um, experience of Jesus, hungry and thirsty at this well, Please teach us from your word. May your spirit fill our hearts, guide our thoughts, and may we walk ever closer with you, I ask. Be with those burdens also that all of us carry. We ask you to intervene, Father. You are the, uh, the source of all wisdom and knowledge, and you know what to do that should be done in each of our lives. So we pray that we will surrender these burdens to you at your throne of grace and ask you to intervene and work out your good will in each of our lives. And we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. And again, I was so thankful to uh, hear uh, the recorder this morning, Brother Woodward uh, Brown, thank you for sharing, and all of you. Now we are going to open up our lesson. Now there's a little leftover from John the Baptist. I'm going to put that at the end. If there's time, we'll go to it because it has some maps in it that may help you to understand uh, how Jesus moved in, in the Holy Lands there. But we'll, we're going to now go to the woman at the well. Do this. I think we're ready. Let me open this up a little bit. We don't know her name. She's just the woman at the well. But just as important truths were taught in John 3 with Jesus' uh, interaction with Nicodemus, here is another interaction, one-on-one -on -one interaction, that is um, superlative in what we learn from it. I can't say superlative over Nicodemus. Both of them, which is impossible grammar-wise, were um, excellent and worthy of our study. So, open your Bibles, please, to John 4. And we're going to read this experience together. If we could, we could gather around together and share reading, like I mentioned last week in our lesson study, um, but we can't. So John 4, starting in verse 1, I'm going to read, but please follow along with me. When therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, um, we've read that. Let's um, move on. Uh, he, verse 3, Jesus left Judea and departed again into Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. Now I want to stop there. The Jews did not go through Samaria if they could help it because they were enemies with the Samaritans. And so they would uh, go to the east or the west. Uh, west would be right up to the Mediterranean coast. But skirt up either way than going through Samaria, but Jesus needed to go through. It was necessary to go through Samaria. Now verse 5, Then cometh he to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near to the parcel of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Now Jacob's well was there. Jesus, therefore, being wearied with his journey, sat thus on the well, and what it means there is there's a curbstone, so, uh, so to speak, around the well, and he was sitting on that, but sat thus on the well, and it was about the sixth hour. That sixth hour is usually understood to be noon, 12 noon, going on, verse 7. There cometh a woman of Samaria to draw water. Jesus saith, saith unto her, Give me to drink. Give is imperative, and Pastor talks often about this use of the imperative, and we'll talk about it in a minute. But nevertheless, Jesus saith unto her, Give me to drink. For his disciple, disciples were gone away unto the city to buy meat, i.e. food. Thus saith the woman of Samaria unto him, How is it thou 
that thou being a Jew, askest drink of me, which am a woman of Samaria? For the Jews have no dealings with the Samaritans. Jesus answered and said unto her, If thou knewest the gift of God, and who it is that saith to thee, Give me to drink, thou wouldest have asked of him, and he would have given thee living water. One of those important lessons we're going to learn from this experience, living water. Verse 11, the woman saith unto her, Sir, and that Sir, let's see, um, that means Lord. That's Kyrios, Kyrios, Sir, translated Lord in other places. The woman saith unto him, Sir, thou hast nothing to draw with, and the well is deep. From whence then hast thou that living water? Art thou greater than our father Jacob, which gave us the well, and drank thereof himself, and his children, and his cattle? Jesus answered and said unto him, her, Whosoever drinketh of this water shall thirst again. But whatsoever... Sorry taking these off. But whosoever drinketh of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst, but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. The woman saith unto him, Sir, give me this water that I thirst not, neither come hither to draw. Jesus saith unto her, Go call thy husband, and come hither. The woman answered and said, I have no husband. Jesus said unto her, Thou hast well said, I have no husband. For thou hast had five husbands, and he whom thou now hast is not thy husband. In that saidest thou truly. The woman said unto him, Sir, Curious. I pursue, perceive that thou art a prophet. Our fathers worshipped in this mountain, and ye say that in Jerusalem is the place where men ought to worship. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, and here's another important truth, Believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor yet at Jerusalem worship the Father. Ye worship ye know not what. We know what we worship, for salvation is of the Jews. But the hour cometh, and now is, when the true worshippers shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Another important truth coming up. The woman saith unto him, I know that Messiah cometh, which is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. Jesus saith unto her, I that speak unto thee am he. And I get a little emotional because here she is speaking with the Son of God, the Messiah. And he's sitting there hungry and thirsty and worn out and hot because it's noon. And um, if only we could have that opportunity, what would we want to talk to Jesus about? But Jesus is telling her great truths. I that speak unto thee am he. And upon this came his disciples and marveled that he talked with the woman Another important truth. Yet no man said, What seekest thou, or why talkest thou with her? You see, it was uh, the way I understand it. Men did not speak to women, a strange women, people they didn't know. Jesus was breaking the code, speaking to this woman, but going on. The woman then left her water pot and went her way into the city and saith to the men, Come, see a man which told me all things that I ever did. Is not this the Christ? Then they went out of the city and came unto him. Um, in the meantime, his disciples prayed him, saying, Master, eat. But he said unto them, I have meat to eat that ye know not of. Another important truth being taught here. 
at this noontime time meeting. And I, um, verse 34, my meat is to do the will of him that sent me. And let's see, oh, and another important truth that we hope to touch on is start, it begins in verse 35. Say not ye, there are yet four months, and then cometh the harvest, then cometh harvest. Behold, I say unto you, lift up your eyes and look on the fields, for they are white already to harvest. And he that reapeth receiveth wages and gathereth fruit unto life eternal, that both he that soweth and he that reapeth may rejoice um, together. And herein is that saying true. One soweth and another reapeth. And uh, we'll stop there for a minute. Um, because, and this is an important truth, and, I'll, and just in case we don't get to it today, I want you to realize that you may be a sower of seed. You may not ever see the results of what you sow because another harvest is, harvests it or reaps it. But we are all working together in God's vineyard and we all rejoice together. But one sows, another reaps. And, and don't be discouraged if what God is calling upon you to do is to scatter the seed. And you might think, I, nothing has come of it. But that doesn't matter. This woman at the well uh, shared the seed, and Jesus stayed there a few more days, two more days, to um, uh, 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 water the seed, help it to grow among these Samaritans. So this is the woman at the well. Desire of Ages 181.4 states. And this is a... Um, a bridge from John the Baptist to this woman at the well. Because at the time, uh, John the Baptist's disciples were in controversy with Christ's disciples. And, and, and Jesus um, didn't want disunity, so he silently left Judea, Judea and went um, to Galilee. And here, Ellen White states, 181 in Desire of Ages, Jesus knew that they, the priests and rab rabbis, would spare no effort to create division between his own disciples and those of John. He knew that the storm was gathering, which would sweep away one of the greatest prophets ever given to the world. Wishing to avoid all occasion for misunderstanding or dissension, he quietly ceased his labors and withdrew to Galilee. However, when he withdrew to Galilee, he passed through Samaria. And here's a map to show Galilee in the yellow and Samaria and then uh, south of Samaria was Jerusalem, and Jesus left this area and went straight through Samaria to get to Galilee. Uh, on the way, and again, Desire of Ages 183, on the way to Galilee, Jesus passed through Samaria. It was noon when he reached the beautiful Vale of Shechem, i.e. the Valley of Shechem. At the opening of this valley was Jacob's well, Wearied with his journey, he sat down here to rest while his disciples went to buy food, probably in Shechem. And here's another um, uh, map, but it's a current map. There's the West Bank in green. And if you lo look above the B in bank, you'll see Nablus. And that's um, where Shechem in this great valley uh, is now. The Bible says Jesus must needs go through Samaria. There was a divine appointment he needed to keep, you see. And um, uh, let me just move on. On the way to Galilee, Jesus passed. Um, I've already, oh, I'm, go, I'm going the wrong direction, sorry. Now, 
you will see in this map in the southwest corner Mount Ger Gerizim, Gerizim. That's how they pronounce it today, Ger, G-E-R, and then split the syllable. The Bible shows pronunciation a different way, but most people say Mount Gerizim. Both Mount Gerizim and Mount Ebal lie west of the Jordan River, Gerizim south of Ebal. The peaks of these two mountains are about two miles apart. The valley of Shechem, which runs between them, is about three miles long and 1,600 feet wide. At the opening of this valley is Jacob's well. Here's a photograph of the two mountains. You don't see the peak of Gerizim on the left, but one is higher than the other, and the valley runs between them. Jacob's Well is now located within a church connected to a monastery. The well is accessed by entering the church, descending stairs to a crypt in which the well is. Along with the well is a small wench, a bucket, and paintings on the wall. But what's interesting is this well is not fed by springs, according to a biblical encyclopedia, nor is water flowed or conducted into the well. It's fed by rainfall and percolation, and the water usually lasts till about the end of May, when the well becomes dry until the return of rain. And here is a picture, maybe late 1800s, early 1900s, and it's hard to see. In the uh, right bottom corner is a woman with a, um, a container on her head. And I put this picture in so that you can see the plain beyond the well. It's a, it's a, a valley, and you can imagine the, the sheep, Jacob's sheep, uh, roaming the plain and this well being used to water his cattle and sheep. I'm sorry, you may be getting pictures faster than I am. Here's a picture, a photograph taken 1895 in the crypt with a woman uh, at the well. Uh, another picture is coming up about the same time. 1900, another woman is at the well, lowering her bucket to get water. I have to wait for my pictures to come. Here is a modern day picture taken at uh, Jacob's Well. They don't allow photographs today. These are early photographs, and this particular one may be an official photograph. It looks like it is. The silver bucket is right before the mouth of the well. But they don't allow photographs because they consider it a sacred site, and it is in a way. But here is another view of the well inside this crypt. Uh, the mouth of the well is there. And then we have another picture, photograph coming up, taken from Far further back, and you can see the paintings on the wall. The paintings were done by the priest in charge of the monastery, is what I, how I understand it. And there is the well and the urn in front of it. But Desire of Ages 188. When the temple at Jerusalem was rebuilt in the days of Ezra, the Samaritans wished to join the Jews in its erection. This privilege was refused them, and a bitter animosity sprang up between the two peoples. The Samaritans built a rival temple on Mount Gerizim. Here they worshipped in accordance with the Mosaic ritual, though they did not wholly renounce idolatry. But disasters attended them. Their temple was destroyed by their enemies, and they seemed to be under a curse. Yet still they clung, they still clung to their traditions and their forms of worship. They would not acknowledge the temple at, at Jerusalem as the house of God, nor admit that the religion of the Jews was superior to their own. Here is a drawing on Mount Gerizim. 
with the ruins left of the temple that had been built. That's about 1880 this drawing took place. And there are still Samaritans today, maybe a, a, a religious group that are known as the Samaritans, and there may be 800, 900 people composing this religious group, and once a year they observe Passover on Mount Gerizim and then move on to the site that is now rubble of where their temple had been built so long ago. And the National Geographic did an article on the Samaritans in 1920. And the author of this article stated that during the entire week following the Feast of Passover, the Samaritans remained encamped on Mount Gerizim. On the last day of the encampment, they began at dawn a pilgrimage to the crest of the sacred mount. Before setting forth, the men spread their cloths on the ground and um, repeat it, the creed and the story of creation in silence, after which, in loud voice, they read the book of G Genesis and the first quarter part of Exodus, ending with the story of the Passover and the flight from Egypt. And that's what they're doing here in this picture around 1920. They're reading aloud. They read the whole book, and they do this today. They read the whole book of Genesis and um, the first fourth of the book of Exodus, and then they go to on their pilgrimage to the site of their ancient temple. And I think the next, next, this is a current day group of people on Mount Gerizim uh, at the Passover time, and the, now, if you will recall the current map I put up of the West Bank, the West Bank, I don't know about today because of the war, but prior to this current war, they were in control of Mount Gerizim, but they allowed the Samaritans to come in once a year for this holy pilgrimage to the site of their um, ancient temple. Now, what do the Samaritans believe? There is a group. We are Seventh-day Adventists. There's a religious group known as the Samaritans. What do they believe? And here I've put, just for um, your edification, that they believe in one God, Yahweh, the same God recognized by the Hebrew prophets. They believe the Torah was given to God by Moses. First five books. Um, but they believe Mount Gerizim, not Jerusalem, is the one true sanctuary chosen by Israel's God. We could say was the one true sanctuary, but they still believe that. Many Samaritans believe that at the end of days, the dead will be resurrected, um, some say by Moses, and they accept the resurrection of the dead based on Deuteronomy 32. The priests are the interpreters of the law and the keepers of tradition. Scholars are secondary to the priesthood. The authority of post-Torah sections of the Tanakh and classical Jewish rabbinical works such as the Talmud and the Mishnah, they, they reject that. They reject the authority of these post-Torah um, works. And interestingly, they have a significantly, significantly different version of the Ten Commandments. For example, the Tenth Commandment is about the sanctity of Mount Gerizim. Now, the Bible talks in a few places about this using the term Samaritan or Samaritans. There are many times the Bible refers to Samaria, but to the people, the Samaritans, um, the Samaritans made high places in 2 Kings 17, 29. We read about that. But we also read about their kindness to captives, and they returned captives. And you can read about that in 2 Chronicles 28, starting in verse 8 through 15, going through 15. <clears throat> Um, when Jesus sent out his disciples, he instructed them not to go to any city of Samaria at that time. They were to go to the lost sheep of Israel. 
Um, there is what we call the Good Samaritan recorded in uh, Luke 10.33. The Bible doesn't use the term good, just a Samaritan came by. And this, you know, we look at this maybe as a parable, but it was a true incident that happened, this incident about who is my neighbor. Um, and we also read about the Samaritan woman at the well. In John 8, 48, Jews accused Jesus of being a Samaritan, of being of this hated sect. And then in Acts 8, Peter and John preached in Samaria. Now, to Sarah of Ages, 183 again. The Jews and Samaritans were bitter enemies and as far as possible avoided all dealing with each other. To trade with the Samaritans in case of necessity was indeed counted lawful by the rabbis, but all social intercourse with them was condemned. A Jew would not borrow from a Samaritan, nor receive a kindness. This explains why this woman came to the well, saw this Jew sitting there, didn't say anything, didn't offer anything, just came and filled her water pot and was about to leave. Um, they, they, um, the, she knew the Jews would not receive a kindness, not even a morsel of bread or a cup of water from a Samaritan. The disciples, in buying food, were in harmony with the custom of the nation. Remember, we just read that in case of necessity, they could trade, and that was approved by the rabbis. Uh, but the quote, Ellen White goes on. But beyond this, they did not go. To ask a favor of the Samaritans or in any way to seek to benefit them did not enter the thought of even Christ's disciples. Now, as Jesus sat by the well side, he was faint from hunger and thirst faint. The journey since morning had been long, and now the, um, the sun of noontide beat upon him. His thirst was increased by the thought of the cool, refreshing water so near, yet inaccessible to him. For he had no rope, nor water jar, and the well was deep. He just couldn't go and scoop up water. My words. The lot of humanity was his, and he waited for someone to come to draw. That was desire of ages. Now, <clears throat> the Bible tells us that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord, Yahweh, my words, Yahweh, it's Lord in all caps. And he delighteth in his way. Now, I just want to stop and tell you a little story. First of all, remember, Jesus was there at the well, going through Samaria out of necessity. He had a divine appointment to keep with this woman. Now, I... I and. Thinking of Psalm 37, 23, that the steps of a man, and it's they've added good, it's, but it's built into um, the, the word man, that this is a, a strong, vibrant, young man, a good man. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I'm thinking of a pastor, an Adventist pastor, not one, not one of um, our group, but was on a plane, returning from Fiji, an 11-hour trip back to California, and the only empty seat in the whole plane was by his side. He had an aisle seat, and the only empty seat was by him, and he wanted it to stay empty. Anyone who's been on a long journey understands that this gives you room to kind of uh, rest easier. So he didn't want anyone. The plane was, doors were closed, no one else was boarding, and he could uh, have a sigh of relief, except he heard the voice of a young lady saying, to the effect that I'm with a group in the back of the plane where we, we've been in Fiji um, on 
doing medical work, but I need some quiet time away from my group, and I'd like to sit in this seat. And so she did. Well, it was a night flight, and soon they were asleep. <clears throat> but about four hours before landing, turbulence set in, waking people. So they were awake. And then soon breakfast was served. And so he engaged in conversation. He was a pastor, Adventist pastor, asking what she had been doing in Fiji. And she explained that there was a medical project that the university was doing. <clears throat> And then in turn she asked him, and he explained he was a pastor and had been in Fiji holding meetings. And um, then he noticed she became very sad and uh, sighed. And let me pull up how she uh, said um, this. And said that a few years before, she had given her heart to Jesus and had lived a Christian life. Those few years, she believed, had been the best of her life. She had felt joy, purpose, excitement. Then she went away to college. And Arlene, I think of you and Susan. Then she went away to college. And the secular atmosphere pulled her away from her relationship with Christ. And... Um, he took the opportunity, as any good pastor would, to talk to her about God and shared scriptures and tips and ideas about how she could reconnect with God. He also shared his personal testimony of his walk with God and then asked if he could pray for her. <clears throat> oh, yes, please, please pray for me. And he did. And when the prayer was over, he noticed she was crying and gave him a hug and said, This visit was ordained by God. You had the only empty seat next to you on the whole plane, and that's where God led me to sit. And you've shared and um, helped me in my Christian walk. Of course, they never crossed paths again. He was scattering seed, brothers and sisters, and also nurturing the experience she had had at one point. And um, we can only hope and pray that she continued to walk closer and closer to God and with God. But why I'm sharing this is, <clears throat> you, you may be stuck by the side of the road, for example, flat tire or whatever it is. You don't like being stuck. You don't like having to uh, figure out problems, especially if you're a female with a car on the side of the road. But then someone stops and helps. And in that moment, uh, we say moment, but maybe 15, 20 minutes, who knows, the love of God is shared. Seeds are planted. You may be the person who has no problems and you stopped and um, helped but and and you may not you may be annoyed in a sense of having to do that just like this pastor on the plane was hoping for an next ex extra room to stretch out in but god had other plans and when we connect with others who are in need, we are um, on a mission just as Jesus was on a mission with um, the, this woman at the well. He had much to teach us today about how he related to her, and hopefully we're going to get to that. But whatever you experience day by day, you should pray for encounters. I think you should. I'm uh, limited with the encounters I have because I stay home with Leon. But you who are up and about, you should pray before you leave home. If there's someone I can help, guide me to that person. And then uh, you can share God's love. You don't have to preach. You don't have to teach. You can just be there with a smile and a helpful gesture to um, bless someone else. But you can preach if you want, pastor, of course, uh, and anyone else. All right, now let's get back. Remember that the steps, your steps, 
or ordered by God, and we delight in how he directs our steps. Let's go on. I'm sorry. Now, I want to talk for just a minute about this imperative that Jesus used. Um, the first thing he says to her is, give me to drink. And um, usually an imperative is an order, a command, a directive. Do this. But, Jesus, but I want to tell you that the imperative can also be a polite request. And most times we must do something to do this or whatever. It's a directive from God as pastor has used it in the past. But here is an example, I believe, of the imperative being used as a polite request. Remember, Jesus was... Jesus was directed there. The Holy Spirit had been working on her heart, preparing for this very moment and to order and to command her to do something would have fostered this um, controversy, this um, antagonism between these two races, the Jews and the Samaritans. I believe... He was asking politely, and we would say today, would you give me a drink, please? But it, it's translating, give me a drink. But the, and it's imperative, but the imperative can be used as a polite request. And I base that also, that idea also, on this quote from Desire of Ages, 183. <clears throat> the hatred between Jews and Samaritans prevented the woman from offering a kindness to Jesus, from her doing it first. But the sa my words then, but the Savior was seeking to find the key to this heart. And with the tact born of love, he asked, not offered a favor, and I would say not commanded a favor, he asked, with tact. He was approaching her with tact, with love, and um, he asked for this drink of water going on. Oops, I skipped it. It went so fast. <clears throat> Just think for a minute of Jesus by this well. Hot, thirsty, hungry, and exhausted from his long trip to that point. Walking. He who made the ocean, who controls the waters of the great deep, who opened the springs and channels of the earth, rested from his weariness at Jacob's well and was dependent upon a stranger's kindness for even the gift of a drink of water. That's the great God the same, and the son of the great God. I, I'm not trying to confuse you, but that's Jesus willing to sit there hungry waiting on someone to offer him a drink of water, but Prejudice prevented her from doing that, so he asked. Jesus said, saith unto her, here's another lesson. Woman, believe me, the hour cometh when ye shall neither in this mountain nor at Jerusalem worship the Father. Desire of Ages, 189. He desired to lift the thoughts of his hearer above the matters of form and ceremony <clears throat> and questions of controversy. The hour cometh, he said, <clears throat> and now is, when the true worshipers shall worship the Father in spirit and, true, and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is the Spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. And, and she had said, you know, you worship at Jerusalem, we worship at a Gerizim, Mount Gerizim. And he said, the hour is coming, and now is, when we worship God in spirit. And he's seeking for such to do that. So, brothers and sisters, it matters not 
I mean, we are not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together, of course. But sometimes we can't do that. Sometimes we're alone in a room or in a home or in a, somewhere out in the woods. If we're worshiping God in spirit and in truth, Jesus wants us to understand that is what matters. Not on this mountain or at Jerusalem is it important. It's in spirit that we are to worship, and the Father seeks such to do that. Desire of Ages 189. Here is declared when he said that. The same truth that Jesus had revealed to Nicodemus when he said, Except a man be born from above, he cannot see the kingdom of God, John 3, 3 margin. Not by seeking a holy mountain or a sacred temple are men brought into communion with heaven. Religion is not to be confined to external forms and ceremonies. The religion that comes from God is the only religion that will lead to God. In order to serve him aright, we must be born of the divine spirit. Um, I, our time is short, so I'm skipping some slides. Part of the Beatitudes is one that says, Blessed are they that do hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Do you know that Jesus hungers and thirsts, not physically as he was then at the well, but he hungers and thirsts, and I want you to know what it is. Our Redeemer thirsts. For recognition, we are not to hide our lights under a, um, a container. Our light is to shine forth. We are not to be ashamed to speak of Jesus. He thirsts for recognition. Now, it's not because he thirsts for self, but because if we recognize him, we are sowing seeds that will Yield a harvest one day. Our Redeemer, going back to the quote, thirsts for recognition. He hungers for sympathy and love of those whom he has purchased with his own blood. Now, how can we sympathize with Jesus? We each have our own sorrows. We each have our own burdens to bear, our own um, Griefs and trials. Jesus had more. Jesus had infinitely more sorrow, grief, trial. But And so we can sympathize in a sense. I understand how painful my sorrow is. I can sympathize with in a little bit, in just a grain of, a, of a, the sand a little bit about how much you have borne for mankind. And I love you for your willingness to do that. He hungers for that. He longs with inexpressible desire that they, the people that he um, um, longs for, all of us, to come to him and have life. As the mother watches for the smile of recognition from her little child, which tells of the dawning of intelligence, so does Christ watch for the expression of grateful love, which shows that spiritual life is begun in the soul. He's watching for that. He hungers and thirsts for that going on. So, the lessons. <clears throat> This is next to last slide. Jesus broke down the barriers of racism. He started to break down it, you know. He gave the example of breaking down the barriers of racism, i.e. between the Samaritans and the Jews, and also between uh, gender discrimination. <clears throat> According to the rules, the protocol of the time, he was not to speak. He, as a Jew, was not to speak to an unknown woman, a stranger, but he did. He broke down that barrier, and women um, take, uh, um, 
strength in the thought that Jesus loves you. Uh, he calls upon men to be our preachers, yes. He calls upon men to be the priests, yes. But he doesn't ignore you in the process, and he didn't ignore this woman, this woman who had a history of ill repute. You may have that history. We all have that history of denying and rebelling against God. But he still loved her and sought. Uh, it was necessary for him to be there to speak to her. He taught how his example was how to meet the needs, how to witness, i.e., uh, the needs of another person. He taught the important lesson of worshiping God in spirit and truth and not by seeking a particular edifice or place or external forms and ceremonies. He taught that he was the living water that would provide everlasting life. He taught the important lesson of what true meat is, and I haven't gone into that, but he, he coming there was thirsty and hungry, but he was not after, after sharing these great truths truths with a heart that received it. So he taught what true meat is to do the will of the Father. He taught the important lesson that one sows and another reaps. One scatters seed and scatters seed and another gathers the harvest, but we all rejoice together. We all work together in the field of God. He taught that at this time. She taught um, or ex was an example of someone hungering and thirsting for truth. She had never heard such truths as Jesus taught her from the priests. She had studied the prophecy of Deuteronomy 8, 15, 1815, <clears throat> we are told in the spirit of prophecy, but didn't understand it. She believed Jesus was the Messiah when he said he was. And as she listened, she was filled with joy. These are all thoughts gained from the spirit of prophecy and imparted to others what she had received immediately. They saw a change in her, and they came to meet this visitor at the well. And Jesus stayed for two more days to water that seed. And that's where we'll stop for now. Let me just see if there's anything... Okay, how many miles was the walk from Judea to Galilee? <clears throat> to Galilee, I, I don't know, but what I can tell you to Samaria, it's an hour's drive. That's all I know. Um, so we, that's something we'd have to look up, Denise. All right, let's close with prayer so they can set up for the uh, worship hour. Father, we're thankful for the example of Jesus at this um, encounter with the woman at the well. We're thankful for all the great truths he expressed in, in uh, a small amount of words, but they reverberate and they grow as they reach our ears. Help us, Father to receive with joy and gladness the great truths you have in your word, just as she received without question um, from Jesus. Please bless the rest of our time together and the rest of these hours of the Sabbath. And we thank you for your great love. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> and I just want to tell you one of the slides I skipped over. Uh, was a quote from Ellen White that said, Jesus could not speak as freely uh, with um, the Jewish people, even, um, you know, the priests, the rabbis. He was reserved with them, but here was a heart hungering and thirsting, and he could speak freely. Bye for now. God bless.